stopping the record. Well, I guess Zoom tells us now that we're recording, so I don't have to tell you. Um, <laughs> Van's going to drop some links in the chat for you to check out as we get going. Um, did Oh, did I mention hi? I'm Stephanie Barrett. Director of Donor Relations at the Coastal Land Trust. Glad to have you here with us today. Um, as usual, we'll have everybody on uh, mute during the talk. And then at the end, we'll have Q&A. And um, you can just unmute yourself and ask a question at that time if you'd like, or drop it in the chat and we'll ask it as we go along. Um, I'm super happy to have Elizabeth Colhoun back with us today. She uh, was one of our very first Little Lunch lecturers a year ago. And um, today we get to have an update on turtles at Masonboro Island. What could possibly be better? Super excited for this. Um, Elizabeth is the stewardship and education specialist for, wait for it, this is a mouthful, the North Carolina Coastal Reserve and National Estuarine Research Reserve. She earned her uh, BS in oceanography from UNCW and her MS in marine biology from Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, she grew up in North Carolina and gained an appreciation for coastal ecosystems and learned the importance of species and habitat conservation. She loves exploring and spending time on the water with friends and family. Elizabeth, thank you so much for coming back to be with us again for Little Lunch Lectures. We are super excited to have you. Thank you for that nice introduction. I'm glad to be back and to talk about more turtles. So I'm, I'm ready if you guys are. Let's go. All right. So I'm going to share my screen. All right. Can you guys see the terrapin on the presentation? Everything looks good. Yep, sure can. Perfect. All right. So like Stephanie said, my name is Elizabeth Calhoun, and I am the Stewardship and Education Specialist for the North Carolina Coast Reserve and near. <laughs> so I don't have to say it all. Um, so I work out of the Southern Sites office, which is in Wilmington, and we are housed at the Center for Marine Science with UNCW. So today we're going to talk about all the turtles at Masonboro Island Reserve. So just a quick overview. Um, we're gonna talk about the program as a whole, who we are, what we do. Um, then I'm gonna go into the different types of turtles that are found on Masonboro Island, um, as well as most of North coastal North Carolina. Um, we'll do an update from the 2020 nesting season for sea turtles, talk about some really cool research we're doing with diamondback terrapins, and then we'll end with Q&A and how you can help. So first, this is just a map of the National Estuarine Research Reserve system. So it's a network of 29 coastal sites that, de that are designated to protect and study estuarine systems. So all 29 of these sites do consistent monitoring that's conducted in order to compare trends across the country. The purpose of this talk is to focus on North Carolina, especially Masonboro Island Reserve. So we're actually going to be focused in on the North Carolina Reserve. Um, some really cool research goes, goes on throughout the whole country, but we're, I'm a little biased to Masonboro, obviously. <laughs> so. Um, so zooming into North Carolina, this is the map of the 10 North Carolina Coastal Reserve sites. So these sites are managed by the Division of Coastal Management. And down here in the bottom of the screen are the four sites that we manage out of our Wilmington office. So the northern one is Masonboro Island Reserve, Zeke's Island Reserve, which is uh, near Fort Fisher. You have Bald Head Woods, uh, Bald Head Island, and then Bird Island Reserve, which is at Sunset Beach on the South Carolina border. So we manage all four of these sites. And you'll notice the green, the green dots are part of the state site. So these are managed just with state funding. And then the blue dots are the national site. So they're part of that National Estuarine Research Reserve Program. So just for today, we're gonna to focus on Masonboro Island Reserve. So that's right here in New Hanover County. So Masonboro Island, hopefully you guys have been able to check out one of 
these 10 coastal reserve sites, if you haven't, I really suggest doing it. They're beautiful sites. Um, Masonboro is about a 5,600 acre protected barrier beach. It has upland areas, salt marshes, maritime shrub thicket, man-made dredge spoil islands, and those are the ones that line the intercoastal waterway. Um, Masonboro really is, it's such a dynamic and changing place, and it's really magical too. I, you can see some of the best sunsets, the best sunrises, we see a lot of sunrises doing sea turtle patrols. <laughs> um, it's also, un, um, it has not been built on, so it is a perfectly pristine beach. It's beautiful. You'll see natural plants, native animals, um, natural stretches of coastline. We also have beautiful marsh systems and grasslands that are really just teeming with life and have things, there's just always something to see out there. And next, Masonboro is also home to many animals. So we have everything from migratory waterfowl during the winter months, shorebirds that are feeding or nesting. Um, so like these little guys, these are actually common nighthawk chicks. And they were nest, this pair nested behind the dunes on Masonboro Island. So there's actually two chicks here and they're about the size. It looks like you put a cotton ball with legs. That's what they look like, they're adorable. Um, so a lot of shorebirds use mason bird to nest. We also have mammals, reptiles. We have um, the turtle species we're gonna talk about. Um, we have snakes, this is a coach whip. Um, it is not harmful in the least bit. They're kind of big and menacing, but they're, they won't hurt you. Um, we also have raptors. So osprey, you might see feeding in the marsh, bald eagles. We usually have a pair that nests up on the north end of Masonboro. Um, yeah, this picture was actually taken on Masonboro Island. So pretty, pretty remarkable shot. <laughs> so there's just a ton of things to see on Masonboro Island. But what we're here for today is to talk about sea turtles and more turtles. But today <laughs> we're just gonna look at the two species of sea turtles that we get on Masonboro Island. So we get nesting activity from both loggerhead sea turtles and green sea turtles. Um, the most common nester we get is the loggerhead. So that's gonna be on this left side of your screen. Um, that makes up for the majority of our nests. They are named for their extremely large heads in comparison to their body. Um, they also have a little different coloration than the other sea turtles. Um, but they are capable of nesting multiple times in a season, which is something that a lot of people don't know. Um, so they can lay multiple nests in one summer season, and usually the nests have about 80 to 130 eggs per nest. And they can get to be about 250 pounds at a full grown adult size. But when they hatch, they're smaller than the size of your palm. So this little picture down here in the bottom is a little loggerhead sea turtle hatchling that came from Masonboro. Um, so they are, as you could imagine, very um, likely to be predated um, because of their size, but they've actually adapted to, they grow really fast. Um, so they can get really big, really fast. Within a year, they're already the size of a dinner plate. Um, so they can, that's how they hopefully get to um, survive and reproduce again. So the second species that we get on Mason Row is the green sea turtle. So these are personally my favorite. Um, they, they get a lot bigger than a loggerhead, um, but as you can see in these pictures, so the green, its head is a little smaller in comparison to its body, whereas the loggerhead, its head is you know big and out there. <laughs> So they will get to be about 300 pounds. And the hatchlings of this species are absolutely remarkable. They are kind of black or this dark blue color on top. And then they're completely white on the bottom. They are, they're beautiful if you ever get to see them. They're a little bigger than a loggerhead and their, their flippers are a little more flappy as I said. <laughs> they're just they kind of move a lot faster than the loggerheads. 
Um, but they're really, really cool species. And this picture actually was taken on Mason Burroughs by some visitors that just happened to be there at the right time. So it's pretty cool. So next, when the sea turtles come ashore to lay their eggs, sometimes they are very determined and they know exactly what they wanna do. Like this one, she came in, she nested up in the dunes and then she went right back out. But we also have those other turtles like this one. She comes in, she goes down here, she goes over here. Um, a lot of times they will kind of roam around till they find the perfect spot that they wanna lay their eggs. It could be um, the lack of dunes sometimes can inhibit them from nesting because they know to go to the high ground. Um, also, they could be spooked. Something could scare them, an animal, people on the beach. Um, but that's called a false crawl. And that it, it happens often. It just means they came up onto the beach, didn't lay their eggs, went back to the ocean, and they'll typically come back the next night to lay those eggs. Um, something that's really cool that is talked about a lot with sea turtles is, do they come back to the same beach to nest? And the answer to that is not always, but they can. So they tend to come back to the same region that they laid their, that they hatched from, but they don't, they don't always do that. So I'm going to tell you a little more about that in a second. Um, but the last thing I wanted to say about nesting was that I mentioned they're capable of laying multiple nests in a single season. So we've had turtles that have laid seven nests in one summer season, which is remarkable. Um, but they could lay one, they could lay seven. They also can take off an entire season from nesting. So they may not lay a single nest and then come back the following year. It's really, they're just, they're some unpredictable creatures, let me tell you. <laughs> so um, before we move on to the next turtle species, I was going to give an update about the 2020 nesting season. So this past summer, we had a total of 41 nests. 38 of those were loggerhead turtles and three were green. Um, like I explained earlier, the false crawls, we had 22 of those where she came up on the beach, didn't lay eggs and went back. We do mark those. And then the other note I wanted to make was that our hatch success on our beach was relatively low this year or this past summer. Um, it was at 64%. And that was due to one, we had a lot of high tide events that created erosion and washed over a lot of our nests. Um, and they just weren't as successful as they have been in the past. But we also had Hurricane Isaias later in the season and that actually took out eight of our nests. So unfortunately we didn't have as great of a year as we wanted, but we still were able to hatch out a lot of turtles. So hopefully, hopefully this year, pray for no storms or not bad storms. <laughs> um, but then the last thing I wanted to mention was the DNA analysis that we're doing with sea turtle nesting. So from each nest that is laid on Mason Bro Island, this project is done in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and the Northern portion of Florida. So from all of those beaches, a single egg is taken from each nest. And this is to run a DNA analysis on the egg to tell us who the mother is. So we are able to tell which mother laid this nest. So that can help us understand how often she's nesting, where she's nesting, how long they nest, some really important questions that we've had over the years. And this project has been going on for a little over 10 years now. So we have a lot of really cool data. Um, but one, one turtle I wanted to mention was we had a mother that returned to us this year in 2020. Um, this past year, and she began nesting with us in 2013. So in 2013, she laid five nests on Mason Monroe Island. Then in 2015, she laid one nest on Mason Monroe Island. Then in 2017, she came back again and laid four nests. And then we had her this past year in 2020, where she laid four nests as well. So it just kind of goes to show she has no other recorded nest in the whole system. 
So she's very loyal and very exclusive to Mason Bro. But then we also have turtles that lay here and then go down to Georgia and lay a nest and then go to Cape Lookout. So it just kind of just kind of depends on the turtle. <laughs> but this one, she's she's very loyal to Mason Bro. So, and then currently. Uh, we had one loggerhead nest this season so far, but I have a team out there right now and they got a false crawl this morning and a new nest. So we now have two nests, which is exciting. So here's the cool part. So we're going to move on to diamondback terrapins, which is another turtle species that is found at Masonboro Island. So diamondback terrapins, they're a really unique turtle because they're an estuarine turtle which means they can live where salt and fresh water meet. So they can actually handle the, the salinity fluctuations that happen in the marshes. They have really unique colors and designs on their shells. So you'll see in this picture, those um, shapes on their shell, and then they all have these really pretty markings on their, on their skin. Um, so they are designed to swim quickly through the water. They can push their way through the marsh grass and they can even submerge and hide in the mud. Um, and they even hide in the mud to overwinter too. So they, they're a pretty remarkable creature. Um, in North Carolina, they are listed as a species of special concern. Um, so they're not listed as endangered or threatened or anything. Um, and you can find them all the way from Cape Cod all the way down to the coast of Texas. Um, they really are critical in the health of our marsh due to the fact that they eat the periwinkle snails. So all the snails you'll see that um, are on the blades of the marsh grass, they eat those. And without the terrapins, the snails would overgraze on the marsh and we could have increased erosion and that doesn't help with storm buffers and water runoff. So they're really important to the survival of our marshes. Um, they are relatively small turtles compared to sea turtles. Um, so they do have multiple threats. One is they lay their eggs on the beach. So just like sea turtles, they come up on land to lay their eggs so they can be predated. The eggs or the mother while she's nesting. There's also um, Traffic issues, so sometimes they're hit by cars if they're trying to cross areas um, to find suitable nesting habitat. But then one recently that we've been kind of focused on is they can become stuck in crab pots. So the funnels on crab pots, they're just large enough for a terrapin to get in, but then they become trapped and they can't get out. Um, just like a sea turtle, they do breathe air. So when they can't get out, they do drown. Um, this seems like a problem that we could manage or mitigate somehow. So we started thinking on, okay, how, how can we better understand these terrapins and how to help them? So combined efforts from multiple agencies, from many years, um, UNCW researchers, students, the Terrapin Tally Project that the Wildlife Resources Commission and the Coastal Reserve do, um, we finally got diamondback terrapins on the map. So we were like, let's study them. So recently those efforts resulted in two terrapin, diamondback terrapin management areas. And one is at Mason Grove Island Reserve and the other is at Bald Head Island Natural Area. And this just means that any crab pot that is deployed in those areas has to have a terrapin excluder device installed on that pot. So hopefully that would help reduce the amount of terrapin bycatch. So I say all that to say that it's very important for the next piece. And I just wanted to point out, this is actually a hatchling from a terrapin. So they are tiny, about the size of a quarter. Their eggs are oblong. And then this is a full grown female. So, but I say all that to say that we have this marsh turtle and we think they're so cool, but we don't know how to protect them well. So what do we do? We don't, we want to know their whereabouts. We want to know their home ranges. We have so many questions. So then comes Dr. Amanda Williard. So <laughs> she has 17 live terrapins that were previously used in a study to investigate the bycatch reduction with the crab pots. Um, 
they were ready to be released and go back to their home at Masonboro. And we thought, perfect, let's put tags on them and see what they do. So the process began. <laughs> we, in, we attached cellular tracking tags to each terrapin on their carapace. So you'll see in this picture, we're putting the um, putty on it to dry. They were measured, when they were weighed, samples were taken. And then when they were done, this is what the final product looked like. So it looks a little silly, I get it, but these were thoroughly tested. They do not weigh more than they should. These, these turtles can perfectly do all their natural behaviors and it does not interfere with their normal activities whatsoever. So they were ready to go. <laughs> so it's crazy. Um, so after the tags were dry, it took about a day to dry. Um, they were ready to be released back to their homes. So this is about, this is in the marshes behind Masonboro Island. And that's Dr. Williard releasing one of our female Diamondback Terrapins to the marsh. Um, they were all released on May 14th. So very recently. Um, and we have received so many pings from these turtles. So they are moving around in the marsh and they are, it's just gonna be really awesome data to see where they go, where they nest, how often they move around, how big their home ranges are. There's just so many questions and um, things we can look into this, into with this data. So we had that, and then this was one that we released. <laughs> it's just so sweet in the marsh. So they actually, when we put them in the water, they kind of hung out for a little bit and then they just dove down and went on their way. So I actually have a video here just to show you how happy they really were. So hopefully you can see it. There is no noise, by the way, it was just, it was very windy. So you'll see him kind of swimming and she pops up to say hello to us before she dives back down and swims away. There she goes. Ooh. So they're just, they're really amazing creatures. And we do um, the Terrapin Tally every year. So that project has been expanded and it's a citizen science project. So I really encourage you to reach out to me if you're interested in paddling, looking for Diamondback Terrapins, if you wanna know more. Um, the project is in the spring, so we are done for this year and we'll be preparing for next year. Um, also, I'm asking everyone, I created a Diamondback Terrapin sighting form, so you can plug in this link to your browser and it'll take you to a form that allows you to report any Diamondback Terrapin sighting that you see. This can be a dead Terrapin, a live Terrapin, um, it's in your backyard, it's anything. We're trying to get a better understanding of where these terrapins are, how many are here so that we can better understand their populations. So if you have questions, there's my name and my email. I'm with the North Carolina Coastal Reserve. And thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I hope you guys enjoyed some of the pictures. <laughs> totally enjoyed that, Elizabeth. Thank Good. You. I think I... I think I set myself up for another talk with the Terrapin information <laughs> to see yeah. the results. Yeah, I think you did. I totally think you did. Um, I was curious, where did, I, I know you said they came from Dr. Williard's lab, but did they come out of the Masonboro um, sound in the first place? Yes, yes. So they were actually, um, they were doing crab pot studies out there to see if the Terrapins would get through the excluder devices and they were terrapins that were caught they they were released back to exactly where they were caught um so yeah they were it's about halfway down the island in the marsh but yeah they they went back to the exact spot where they were caught in a crab pot so okay and mm -hmm. so is that considered their home range or their home range can go further which is what you're going to find out by the the tags yes and previous studies have said it's not very far at all like very small home ranges and the pings that we're getting i mean they're kind of staying in the same little marsh 
So it's gonna be it's gonna be really interesting to see if they all do the same thing or if some really range and go all the way to the north end or move to other islands, which has not been seen really previously. So cool. Who else has questions? You can feel free to come off mute and ask or or type it in the chat. Hey Elizabeth, I have a question. Yeah. Oh, so, hey. Hey. Um, how long do you expect those radio tags to transmit? Oh yes, I did forgot to mention that. Um, so those tags will naturally fall off. We are thinking because um, when they're scoots, so when their shell sheds, that tag will come off and hopefully it'll still be sending a signal that we can go retrieve it. Um, but Amanda is thinking that they should stay on till next spring. So hopefully we'll get about a year of data. Thanks, I was wondering if we were gonna get the winter data too to see kind mm -hmm. of hang out. Yep. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Hi, Elizabeth, this is Gail. I have a question. So I volunteer up at the Karen Beasley Center. And uh, so I just moved from New Jersey. So all of this is kind of new. But, you know, there's a whole um, group of beach walkers to collect, um, you know, information about the nests and whatever. Is Mason Burrow information collection totally separate than collection for like topsoil and the other beaches? For sea turtles or for, for sea turtles? For sea turtles. Yes. So each beach has its own program, but all of the information that's collected is submitted to the same database. So um, you should be able, it's called seaturtle.org. Yes. Um, so you can actually log on to that and see what beaches are reporting nests. Um, but so all the all the beaches have their own programs and their own setup, but all the data goes to the same place. But do, like, do, do you have or do you need walkers for Mason Borough? So typically we have community volunteers walk with us. So our beach is about eight and a half miles long. So it is a long walk. We get dropped off at one end and go all the way to the other. Um, but we do usually have community volunteers go with us. Last year was the first year we did not because of COVID. And this year, currently, our guidelines are not yet to the point that we can have volunteers on our boat for transport. Okay. But usually we do. And when okay. we can, it will, we will make that known. <laughs> okay, great. So maybe next year, you're saying? Yes, yes, for okay. sure. Because we love having people walk with us. Great. Okay, thank you. Yep. Stephanie. Yeah, Bruce, go ahead. I have a question about what's being done on Masonboro Island mm -hmm. to protect the animals that are there. Um, I go over, uh, a lot of us do, from Pages Creek area mm -hmm. to Rich Inlet. And Audubon every year puts out poles and tries to keep people out of nesting areas, particularly for the plovers. But people let their dogs loose mm. and they are not kept out of those nesting areas. What are you doing at Masonboro to try to control predators, particularly mm. predators that people bring over to the island? So currently we have the same setup. So at all the high trafficked areas where people might land a boat, um, we have all of those areas posted with Ottawa and shorebird nesting signs. We also, if there's a real problem, the enforcement for Masonboro Island would be the Sheriff's Department. Um, currently, none of us have any authority. We're just <laughs> stewards. Um, so if there was a real issue, the Sheriff's Department is who we would go to. Um, and we take this stance of education um, because we don't have that hard enforcement power. Mm -hmm. When I do see people that are running their dogs off leash, um, I remind them that it's a countywide rule. So having their dogs on leash is a New Hanover County rule and it does apply to Masonboro Island Reserve. Oh. Um, I also can use the, they're very cute fluffy chicks and you don't want your dog to hurt them. And that can usually you know, persuade people. <laughs> um, but we kind of take the route of education and just letting people know that that is what is going on. Um, and then if, if there's a real problem, then we can get the sheriff's department involved. Okay. 
it's, it's a, it's an issue and it's hard. It's a hard one to deal with. Mm -hmm. All right, are there any other questions for Elizabeth? Cool. Well, thanks everybody for being here today. Thanks Elizabeth for being here today. I just, this is one of my favorite topics and- um, <laughs> I can talk about it forever. If you want more Terrapin pictures, please tell me. <laughs> I've got videos for days. Well, maybe we should have made it a big lunch lecture. <gasps> we should. <laughs> Maybe another time, maybe another time. So, um, all right, so speaking of Little Lunch Lectures, we are going to move to a one time a month over the summer for June, July, and August. So please keep your eyes on your e-news and social media for Coastal Land Trust to find out about the topics and the dates um, coming up. And um, I do just want to mention on um, June 5th, is our flytrap frolic day, but it is kind of like this progressive hybrid event. So um, it will be, there are tours happening in the garden, but they are all reserved in full. But then that afternoon we'll be at flytrap brewing, um, tabling and doing trivia and fun stuff. So if you wanna stop by flytrap brewing, come by on June 5th, two to five. Um, we're having a flytrap brewing raffle with all kinds of swag and gift cards and glasses and stickers. Um, it's $80 value, but you can um, get a chance to win for 25 whole dollars um, as a donation to the Coastal Land Trust. Um, that link is in the chat if you're interested. And also on June 5th, um, one of our awesome sponsors of the Flytrap Frolic is Great Outdoor Provision Company. And part of that sponsorship is Land Trust Day. They give 5% of their sales in the Wilmington and Greenville stores to the Coastal Land Trust. So if you've been needing some new gear, wait till June 5th and go get it at Great Outdoor. And then there is a, a donation that comes back to the Coastal Land Trust um, for that. So such a cool partnership and such a, such a great um, organization um, that they support us every single year with that. Um, so let's see, is that, is that all I need to say about July 5th? Oh, no, there's not. June 5th, we were also going to release an interactive experience on our website all about the, the reader garden and carnivorous plants. So like the fun continues with carnivorous plants all the time. Um, on our website. So y'all stop by the website and check that out. Um, it's it's going to be really quite cool. Um, so I hope everyone has a great long weekend. Um, I hope you are all well and we'll see you soon right back here at Little Lunch Lecture. Watch your e-news. Okay, bye. Take care. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.